Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Nourish Child Podcast. I'm Jill, your host, and today I have JC Lippold on the show. He is a professional homemaker, holding space for others as a nationally renowned teacher of movement and mindset, a community engager and social movement trailblazer, a theater director, and also as a full-time leadership and change management coach and consultant. I had the honor of meeting JC back in January, and I am super excited to talk with him today about shame. And it's a, it's a big topic, and we're going to go around and around and around. And JC comes at it from a very different um, frame. He's been uh, an expert, right, in the field, in the fitness world. Um, he works as a consultant alongside brands. Um, and his, he is passionate about redesigning the fitness landscape in the U.S. to where the target audience is, and that is everyone. So we're going to take his knowledge and we're going to apply it to parenting and kids and nutrition and fitness. And it's going to be an awesome conversation. Welcome to the show, JC. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. I mean, the audience has no idea how much trouble we just had getting connected. And (laughs) our computers are wanting a little bit of love from us right now, apparently. It's something like that. I know. I know. So, okay. Welcome and please introduce yourself and tell us um, how you how you got into this work, what you're doing, you know, on a day to day basis. You have a lot of pies in the in the in the kitchen, so to speak. (laughs) And um, I just I'm curious as to like how you spend your days and how you got into what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you said it. I'm one of those people that the the most uh, fearful I ever am is when I have to answer the question, "What do you do?" Uh, because in a in a cultural context, uh, it seems like I have many pathways. But um, you know, as, as I start my bio, I really see myself as as a proverbial homemaker, right? In all the worlds in which people don't feel the the nicety of home, the safety of home, the ability to be honest and authentic at home. That is, is what I, what I try to create for people. Um, whether it, um, is, is in any of these, these avenues where people come together to, um, explore themselves, explore their passions, explore their capacity. Um, I exist in a lot of those, um, those rooms. So as a coach, as consultant, um, I was a youth director for 10 years. I have a a theater background. So, so the ability to tell stories. Um, and then for the last 10 years, I've been very much focused on rather than taking care of, of young people, uh, taking care of the, the, the childlike, uh, elements, um, of people after they're, uh, uh, grown up. So yeah. in the fitness world and the wellness world, um, mindset and movement, um, that's, that's where I spend most of my time taking care of those people in the worlds when they're very much themselves. Got it. And I, I mean, the whole like analogy of homemaker and working with kids for 10 years. I mean, this show is all uh, it's it's designed for parents so that they can be better caretakers, better feeders of their children. And so I love the the synergy that we're going to have there, because when you think of homemaker, I oftentimes think of a parent and um, who who wants to make a warm, cozy, loving home and one of the things that sort of just struck me me is that you know creating a safe haven at home is not always easy to do today yeah and i i i recently last week heard um um a colleague of mine amanda brinkman um share um she was she was um at a breakfast that i was that i was hosting and she shared with the with the the host of the breakfast that uh, you know she is a, an eleven year old daughter, and she was like, "I rock at being the parent of an eleven year old." 
And then she's like, and I never realized this before, but there's this assumption that parents should be good at, at being a parent at all ages. And then if we look at teachers, teachers specialize in being pre-K or being elementary school or being a specific subject. So I really think of this idea of, of the bandwidth that a parent has to hold on to um, and that, that they have to be exemplar at day in and day out. Uh, it's a wonderful place to start this conversation around shame and isolation and the things that we do to ourselves to attempt to um, make ourselves feel um, that things are maybe simpler than they are, rather than acknowledging um, the freedom we have, knowing that we're going to make mistakes, that we're going to have to speak the truth and watch the truth change and challenge us. So uh, there's no better environment, I think, than looking through the eyes of a parent for, for this conversation. Yeah, yeah. And parenting is not easy. And when you say, I'm great at an 11, being an 11-year-old parent, that resonates with me because I used to always say, I'm great at being a parent of babies and toddlers. Teens, very challenging. You know, yeah. and I had four. Uh, I think you know that I had four who were all teenagers at the same time. And whoa, it was not easy. And so when we're talking about guilt and shame, and I, I actually would like you for the audience to, def to define the difference of the two. But um, when you don't feel you're doing a good job, like you're not being exemplary, it can cause a lot of um, dissonance, disconnect, shame, guilt, all the things. So let's talk about guilt and shame and sort of just for the audience, help them understand the difference because there is there is quite a difference. Yeah, absolutely. So as we have, um, I, I've been on a team of individuals working on you know, the first comprehensive research on food and fitness and body shaming um, in, in the United States. And <clears throat> it all starts from exactly where you just said, this desire to, to do good. Um, that is as broad as, as we can say that, right? Everybody has the innate desire to do, to do well, to do good, to do right. So because we have that, um, we get to the place where, you know, we seek what is the pathway to, to do the right, to do the good. And people who support parents or consumers who are deciding what to, you know, feed themselves, feed their families, how to move their bodies, how to be well, we create simple messages. We go, hey, the best thing I can do for my followers, for those people who are looking to me, is to create as simple of a path as possible to where they want to be. And that's the start of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, as we'll talk about today, it isn't simple. So when we attempt to simplify things that are complex, we end up creating a wonderfully intense internal problem that leads people into um, guilt. Mm -hmm. Guilt, the, the sense that I am not doing something um, correctly. Um, and of course, where do we put the blame? On ourselves. Where does that drive us? Into isolation. Another really intense feeling. You know, and all of a sudden, all of the voices exit the understanding of what I'm going through. Uh, but I love sharing um, the three definitions. If, if, if you look up shame, if you Google image search shame definition, this is what you get. A painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. Number two, a loss of respect or esteem, dishonor. And number three, a regrettable or unfortunate situation or action. Guilt is something that I like to think of, you know, if, if, if we are a planet, guilt is, is the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the thing that we sense, the thing we can point to. Here's the action that I feel guilty about. Shame is in our core. It's, it's so ingrained in who we are that it's hard to remember that it's there. But it's the thing that becomes everything we feel, everything we think, and everything we see. And why do we end up moving into a space of shame? Because we're often led to this belief that things are simpler than I actually am experiencing. Yes. And, and, and when we think that is the normal, 
it drives us into this cycle of shame faster and faster and faster. So can we unpack that just a little bit more and share some examples of how, let's talk about the nutrition industry. Let's talk about the fitness industry. How are we collectively, because you and I are both in these industries, how are we making messages or conveying messages that are too simple? Yeah. Um, I will share, um, I'll share one from kind of both, both sides of the world, um, from the food side. Um, um, let's look at clean your plate or, or shop the perimeter or eat the rainbow or, um, we put them both together, move more, eat less. All of these things you go, Oh yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is eat less and move more and everything will be okay. This is the one that, 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 that gets me that I think uh, makes people go, oh, very quickly. We hear often this idea of um, all you have to do is be better than you were yesterday. Or I always love the mathematical clarity of be 1% better each day. Yeah. Well, I just turned um, 41, which means that I think I should be 14,965% better than the day I was born. Yeah. <laughs> when I put it that way, um, it's irrational. Yeah. But we are fed these ideas that sound so wonderfully simple. And here's how the cycle works. We hear simple messages. Therefore, we think our food and fitness goal should be easy. All of a sudden, we do those things that we're told to do. And we find out that it's not simple because we fail. Right. And because we fail and we don't meet our goals, uh, we feel guilty. And that guilt drives us into isolation. Yeah. I did something wrong. I'm going to put my tail between my legs. I'm going to stop going to the gym. I'm going to stop trying to eat well. I'm going to stop da 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 da, -da. And sooner or later, that shame bubbles over and we feel ashamed of ourselves. And obviously the world fe feels ashamed of us too. So what do we do? We get desperate and we look for the simple answer to fix ourselves. And then the cycle starts all over again. Yeah. And how often is shame born of the greatest intentions? Yeah. It's I'm going to create this really easy pathway um, uh, for my, you know, for my family, for my, for myself, um, yeah. for those people in my influence. And under those wonderful intentions, we're forgetting that there's a complexity that people need to have us walk alongside them with mm -hmm. rather than be like, here's the answer, go do it. And if it doesn't work, it's your fault. What are some of the um, assumptions under these simple paths? What are some of the assumptions that are being made? Aside from the fact that, you know, it's easy if I'm thinking of myself and I'm saying, okay, here's how you make a balanced plate. It's this food group, that food group, this food group, and that food group. Get five food groups on your plate and you have a balanced plate. What are the underlying assumptions that I'm making when I give that information to my audience? Yeah, absolutely. What are the steps? What are the actions? And what are the paradigms or automated mindsets that people need to have in order to get those foods onto the plate? What do they have access to um, in terms of time, in terms of money, um, in terms of proximity to, um, to grocery stores or convenience stores that are going to have those things? Yeah. Um, yeah. And even deeper and softer, what about people's tastes? What about people's moods? What about on the day that um, someone really doesn't want the balanced meal, yeah. um, but they want, um, I, I share this story often, uh, you know, in my world, there's days that end up being 14, 15, 16 hours long, and I get to the end of it. And, you know, as a, as a person who grew up where you know, McDonald's was a birthday meal and, you know, the big buffet restaurant where I could eat as much as I want and have variety was our Sunday morning, you know, special. Um, at the end of a long day when my body's in fight and flight and it's stressed, what is the best option for me to tell my body, 
hey, we're okay, we're safe. You can return to a rest and digest existence. It's probably better and healthier in this very specific context for me to go get a Happy Meal than for me to go ahead and make a, a kale salad at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. yeah. Now, again, physiologically, that makes a lot of sense. Nutritionally, it actually kind of makes a lot of sense if we actually believe there's room for all foods and, and balance and da 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 But even saying something like, well, yeah, it's okay to treat yourself every once in a while, that sentence is laden with guilt. And it's like, oh, I can eat this, but I need to not enjoy it very much because this is a treat. It is, this food has more value because it's really bad, but even bad things are okay sometimes. When in reality, we're training people not to listen to what their bodies are telling themselves, but to stay within this tightrope confine that if we fall off, something really bad is waiting for us. Yeah. Or we're sending the message that you can only have that food when you are strung out, overworked, exhausted, yeah. um, and not at your best self, for, exactly. for, so to speak. So yeah, it's very interesting because part of this study, when I heard you speak back in January, part of this study on nutrition and fitness professionals one thing that really jumped out at me and I was like, whoa, was this whole idea that dietitians, like the rest of the world, favor or prioritize flavor, the flavor of food and how much it costs. Like, I know that is exactly how I shop. I'm like, does it taste good? And can, not can I afford it so much, but is it a good deal? Yes. Is it is it a value to 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 get this food? That is my personal filter when I'm at the grocery store for myself, for my family. And yet this study indicated that dietitians don't necessarily hold their clients to the same standard. Yeah. Let's unpack the, that. The 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 right answer um, for an RDN and for a fitness professional. Um, and culturally, a mindful, healthy human being is that we should care about the amount of protein, nutrients, fiber, sodium levels, amount of sugar. These are the things that should be the criteria for the, for, for the foods we purchase. Um, but as you just said, Jill, what do we do in, in our own lives? Taste, cost, convenience. Mm -hmm. Why? Because those are really not only wonderful factors to lead people to a happy, fulfilled life, but there's a great practicality that points to the complexity of forming a life that um, that we can live. Yeah, you know, yeah. there there may be a a right answer, and often, um, you know, this this leads into another, you know, kind of. Um, uh, hard to swallow part of part of the research is when we go here are the right answers and we live in a world where we have more access and more awareness because this is our work um to maybe quote quote better options uh the world looks at us and they go you know what i understand what you're saying and i understand that it is true in the way they they perceive what we are saying what the world tells them but what does that lead us to being very much out of touch mm -hmm. from, from, from our, from our clients, from those people who we are hoping to serve. Let's look at fitness professionals. And sometimes fitness professionals will, you know, say, you know what, shaming my, shaming my clients, if it uh, helps them commit to their goals, isn't absolutely the worst thing in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we look at, as, as we look at the ways that we attempt to be helpful, um, most of the time, we end up leaving our clients feeling like they need to guard themselves from us because we are the epitome of perfection and rightness, and they are not. Yeah. So as we look at that, um, for all of the, the RDNs um, you know, out there, a lot of this research shows that, uh, that RDNs are seen as knowledgeable, but not relevant. 
um, out of the people. <laughs> yeah, I, like, like I, um, now, now, now again, knowing this is really wonderful because then we can do something with it. Right. You know, um, 60, 62% of consumers who were um, part of this research believe that RDNs extremely knowledgeable. Only 20% feel that they are affordable. Nearly half of consumers don't know how to start the process with an RDN. So think about the courage to, to be curious and say, hey, world, um, where is someone, where is an RDN um, who can answer the question, if I, if I have anything that I can gain from, from, from knowing you, from, from working with you? Does it mean I'm broken? Does it mean that, like, do I need to be pre-diabetic? Do I need to have an eating disorder to go ahead and work with an RDN? Like, like how, how quote, quote, bad do I have to be mm. before I open a conversation? And 20% say uh, of, of the consumers, you know, in this research study, say that nutrition suggestions from RDNs are not possible for my lifestyle or, quote, quote, someone like me. And I always think of, think of moments like that. And I go, who are they assuming they are? Yeah. And who's responsible yeah. for creating that paradigm, for creating that lens? So with that being said, uh, the opportunity that we have, and I think this goes for RDNs, I think this goes for fitness professionals, medical professionals, I think this goes for parents, um, that when we take ourselves off the high shelf that people perceive that we are on, all of a sudden, the knowledge, the resources, and maybe most of all, the love and care that we have for these people, our kids, our clients, um, they start to go, oh, you aren't out of reach. You aren't out of touch. You actually don't desire to judge me, to shame me. Uh, so when we slow that conversation down and shine enough light on it, mm -hmm. then we start to see what becomes possible in derailing the cycle of shame. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. and. I mean, the research study is in a lot of ways groundbreaking and yes, hard to swallow because there's a lot of um, pride around having a, a level of knowledge and, and being able to shape and guide a person's life just with what's coming out of your head because you've spent all these years, you know, learning. But what I hear you saying, and honestly, what I've, I've done a lot of research on my upcoming book, and, and there's a lot of, you know, information around shame and self-compassion and, and connection um, from, from parents to their children and how that is much more powerful in helping children do anything, right? Do anything they want to do, but even moreover, feeling worthy and, and uh, self-empowered. So it's not a, it's not a weakness. And I think that this is the challenge is that sometimes when we're a quote unquote expert or we're, when we're a parent, um, or the CEO of a business or the fitness guru that you're, you know, you've hired three times a week to get you in shape. You know, we look we look to those individuals as being the expert, as having more knowledge than we do. And yet what is so powerful and what I hear you saying is that putting yourself sort of on the same playing field um, is, is really where the power is. Kids change a lot. Their nutrition needs, eating habits, and food preferences do too so much so it can be hard to keep up. The Nourish Child, a website designed for parents who want more nutrition education, helps parents like you get crystal clear on raising good eaters. We've cracked the code on nourishing the whole child, whether you're raising a baby, a teen, or a child with health concerns. Our nutrition school and parent education programs help you get the inside scoop on food and nutrients, positive food parenting, and building self-motivated, autonomous kids who are good eaters. Visit thenourishchild.com today. Yeah, and Jill, I'll, like, I'll, I'll even shift that slightly. Because power probably right. isn't the right word, right? 
Yeah, well, and, and the thing is, it's rather than placing ourselves on the same level as them, because we do have information, we do have insight and pathways to um, to where they may be seeing they want to go. And often when we go, hey, I am like I am right here next to you, often convolutes the potency we have and the influence we have. So I always like to say, um, you know, rather than placing yourselves on the same level, place yourself slightly below them mm. to be to be the person saying, hey, you are uh, you are everything you need to be. And I have investment in you. And I also have knowledge and resources that when I go, hey, um, you, you just shared this with me. This is your truth. I hear what you're saying. Where is that coming from? You know, there's a lot of research that shows. Or, you know, perhaps why you're feeling what you're feeling is, here's our cultural context that guides us to to da 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 And all of a sudden, when they go, oh my gosh, I don't need someone to, to complete me. I don't need someone to fix me. Uh, but what I have here within this person is someone who's reflecting um, who, I, who I am in, in all honesty, but also not shying away from seeing the shame that is sitting on my shoulder, from acknowledging the reality of the systems that have, that have really uh, guided me into where I am and how I am. Because of course, mm-hmm. none of us exist in a vacuum. You know, I always, I always share this Edith Wharton quote, you know, there are two ways of spreading light, to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. And the reason why I share that quote is it reminds us that when we feel like we're in isolation, um, when we feel like we are the fault, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of food, body, uh, and fitness shaming, uh, people go, this is my fault. This is, we, we, we had a, a wonderful, um, uh, uh, interview with one of the uh, participants in this research who ended up saying, um, uh, we did a, a qualitative interview with her as well. And she's like, you know what? Um, ever since I went back to school, um, I, I've really gotten lazy. Um, and, you know, I, I just need to get back to, to, to trying something new. This is a single mom of two kids working full time and now going back to school. And she goes, I am lazy because I'm not getting to the gym. And then she says, I need to get back to doing something new. Like you can't get back to doing something you haven't done before. But we are so spun into thinking this world is happening to us rather than through us that she goes, I'm supposed to feel lazy. I'm supposed to guilt myself because I'm the one who's not carving out the time because another simplified quote, we all have the same 24 hours in the day. Actually, we don't. Um, we all have 24 hours, but the opportunity cost of each of those minutes and the relationships we have that, that we devote that time to. And also no one gets to tell us how we envision our 24 hours, but because we are often led to think that there is a simple path or a right path most people think, well, if it's simple and I can't do it, I must be broken. And if there's yeah. a right path and I'm not on it, I'm wrong. Attempt to change yeah. anybody who thinks that they are wrong and responsible for their wrongness, um, it's really hard to do. Yeah. How do you think social media plays into this, particularly you know, with the wellness and fitness experts and nutrition experts in social media, because I mean, I look at some of it and I think, and my listeners have heard me say this before. I really don't like social media because the nuance is lost. And yet I do it. I do it. And I try to make it simple. I mean, I'm, I'm probably, you know, on some level contributing to the shame that some people are feeling, not intentionally. Um, but when you think about social media and the wellness and the fitness industry and the messaging that's out there, is that contributing or is there some, you know, I guess, where does personal sort of agency come into play? Yes. Like, Yeah, you, 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 you just said it. 
um, there's a great amount of agency that if we put it back into people's hands, if we um, invite people to see that, again, that they have um, some power and some influence over their lives because they actually aren't broken, they actually aren't wrong, they actually aren't lost. Because you know, people always ask the social media question, and the first thing I say is, it's a really simple pathway to go ahead and point the finger at social media and like, that's the thing that's, that's like, if we fix social media, then everything will be fine. Because I always, I always say, um, you know, and Jill, you, you were in the room when I did this. I was like, hey, who, who in this room existed before social media? And a majority of the people are like, yep. And then all of a sudden, decade to decade, starting in the 1940s, I flashed on the screen images, media, advertising from every decade, from the 40s until today. And I will tell you, social media ain't got nothing on the messages and the images we've been throwing at people in very, in very much slower times of our cultural narrative. So I'm not, I'm not letting social media off the hook. And I always make this analogy. Um, you know, if, if, if I would ask someone, hey, um, is a hammer good or bad? And I think people would go, well, what, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. And I go, well, well, if, if we're saying, is, is, is social media good or bad? I, I want to ask about another thing. Like, let, let's look at a hammer. And they go, well, it's, it's a hammer. And I go, okay, well, that hammer could build a house or it could severely hurt somebody. It could be a weapon. So um, is, is a weapon good or bad? And, and they go, well, well, it depends. And I go, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tool that we get to choose how we use. Because I could go ahead and, and show the wonderful benefits of social media um, and the power in people who are consciously um, thinking about their messaging mm-hmm. to influence people. Um, and of course, we, we, we all know those people. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're infallible. It doesn't mean that they, that they like you said, Jill, that, that they don't add to the shame. We all do. Um, but at the same time, I could also go, here's 100 examples of social media being really bad. So let's think of it in a parent context. Um, uh, if, uh, if a parent says, I do not let my kid use social media um, because social media is bad. Well, just like Shane, these things are pervasive. They are going to look at any element of social media through the lens of, of this is a bad thing rather than um, inviting the critical discernment it slows all of us down to go, is what I'm consuming right now intended for good? Am I, am I making a conscious choice right now? Um, or, or is this bad? Or am I not consciously choosing to, to, to digest? Um, social media, I don't think is any different than, than food or fitness or anything else that, that, that we consume. Mm-hmm. The scary thing is, and it's twofold, number one, are we aware of what we are consuming? And number two, are we led to believe that something is innately good or innately bad? Because again, we, we, look at, we look at people walk down center aisles of grocery stores and they hang their heads down and they move quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, and you go, well, well why? And it's because um, without even knowing it, we have these senses about goodness and badness mm-hmm. uh, you know i i i uh the as we look at sources of shame it's really interesting so body shaming food shaming and fitness shaming from the consumer's perspectives here's the top five um groups that they go this is this is most most responsible for shame number one social media influencers um number two friends and family uh think about think about the the parent who um, I had a, a, a friend over the weekend text me. Um, they were out of town and they're like, well, Saturday morning. And my mother is already, um, you know, telling me that she wishes that I wouldn't drink so much Diet Coke because da 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 da. And all of a sudden it sent this friend of mine into a spiral of going, I am letting my mother down because I'm drinking a, a can of Diet Coke. Yeah. And how do we reach that conversation? Number three is our peer group and work colleagues. How often do we compliment people um, or think we're complimenting people? Oh, you look really good today. 
oh, have you lost some weight? Um, oh, uh, I, and, and, and vice versa, the, 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 the comments that are meant to be shared quickly and to have a high solubility and a you know, high metabolism. It's like, I'm just saying this thing as I'm walking down the hall, but we are constantly judged alongside our peers. Mm -hmm. The fourth is fitness and nutrition prep, uh, professionals. We are fourth on the list. And that's sad and scary for us. But if we think, who do we represent? If people don't feel safe entering conversations with us, you know, again, Jill, and, and, and I know this resonates with you too. I've spent my whole life attempting to make people feel enough at, in these safe realms. And still the amount of times I have friends and colleagues who come up to me, who I've known for decades, who go, gosh, you know, I, I'm really scared to say this, but you know, I always feel really guilty anytime I see you post um, post something because like you're you're the fit person and I am not the fit person. And of course, then I go, it's like, but my whole MO is 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 the opposite of that. And then I have to check myself and I go, what are they responding to? Yeah. They're responding to the reflection of the light of shame shining um, versus that independent relationship which again shows that this is not a quick process. There is not a do these three things and everything will be fine and fixed. Because yeah. um, in the fifth on that list is medical professionals, you know, primary doctors, pediatricians, um, where, you know, we, we, we know like there are some things that, you know, I, I get really anxious anytime I have to go in for my dental cleaning. I have really bad genetics with my teeth. They're not going to believe me when I say I floss. Um, I have a cavity in every one of my teeth. And ever since I was a kid, I have never felt so bad walking into a room than walking into a dentist's office because I know that in that room, I'm not enough. I am, I am a bad person in that space. Does that mean that the dentist is, is wanting me to feel bad or is consciously going, this person is bad? Probably not. But even if they are, that is that shame living inside me mm -hmm. that once we shine the light on, it begins to lose power. But I think we're so focused on going, how do we get rid of the source of shame? Rather than going, hey, this is not a get rid of, this is a how do we move forward with. Okay, so let's do that. Let's move forward with de-emphasizing shame or a positive path forward. Yeah. So um, there's, there's two things that, that, that I like to bring up here. Um, one is, you know, a concept that uh, um, I speak of consistently, and, and it's this idea of enoughness. Yeah. Enoughness, I uh, define as the awareness of what you have that can be put to use with no attachment to what tomorrow brings. So enoughness isn't complacency. It's, it's, it's not the game of um, uh, blind yourself to, to what your body's telling you, to what the world's telling you, to what you can dream of, to, to where you can maybe, maybe bring yourself to in, in whatever your endeavors are. But to say, right now, today, um, I'm thoroughly capable enough of existing today in a positive, powerful, present way. And when I do that day after day, um, it's pretty amazing to see what happens. Now, again, that, sound, that may sound like a simple you know, a, a simple pathway, but rather than it being an answer, it's something to keep thinking about. Yeah. Two of the things I speak of in enoughness, number one is minimizing um, the minimizing language in your life. So think about the words just or only. Well, I, I was only able to, um, to go for a walk today, or, you know, I'm just going to start, um, you know, adding in um, some leafy greens, you know, um, uh, when, I, when I think about it throughout the week. Removing the words only and just in those two statements mm -hmm. instantly amplifies the power. Like, like um, in a fitness world, hey, it's okay, it, it's okay to, to just walk. Wow, is it really? Because you never tell anybody it's okay to just run really fast or to pick up the heaviest weight in the room. No, we would never tell anybody that it's okay to do more. It's not okay to win a gold medal. We only use okays and justs when we are pandering to what we perceive as less than. What's an example uh, of okays, Jake? So, um, so like, like it's it, it's okay to take it easy. Yeah. As opposed to take it easy. 
Hey, how are you feeling today? Oh gosh, it's a I had a rough night. Well, it's okay to take it easy. Or gosh, I had a rough night. Ah, oh, take it easy. Yeah. Okay, I will. So and I guess sudden, from like a parenting, extending this into a parenting thing around food, when you're talking to your child, um, losing the if you would just eat your vegetables. Yeah. Or too. It, like, yeah, it, like, like, um, hey, um, maybe, maybe you only eat um, two of the Brussels sprouts. Hey, eat, 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 eat a few Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it shortens the conversation as well, internally and externally. Because if it's, um, hey, eat a few Brussels sprouts, and they go, no, all of a sudden, you both understand where each other's at. <laughs> if all of a sudden, it's like, well, um, maybe you can just eat two Brussels sprouts today. And, uh, I, he, here's an example I, I use for my childhood. Um, uh, you know, I was, a, a pretty scared, emotional, non-athletic, non-competitive kid. Um, and I remember standing on the edge of the diving board, um, and the kids in the pool already in the deep end of the water screaming, just jump, just jump, just jump. And for me, it wasn't a just act. It was a, I may die, but at the same time, I am not going to be validated as a young boy if I don't start doing boy things, like jumping off the diving board. Yeah. So all of a sudden, this just is making me hot, you know, hot flash panic when if someone is like, hey, jump. And if I go, no, then they go, okay. Or they start literally frontedly shaming me it's like oh like if you don't jump then then all of a sudden the, the shame is clear yeah it's something that we can hold on to it doesn't make it any better it doesn't make it any less powerful but if we see it then we can acknowledge it and once we acknowledge it we can decide what to do with it yeah so in that in in, in that framework um you know parents have a wonderful understanding um so often of of what may be a just act with their child. So just may be a word to use. It's like, hey, um, just do this thing. And they and the kid goes, oh yeah, this is a just thing. This isn't that big of a thing. What a wonderful reminder. Mm -hmm. But they're mindlessly using minimizing language, like just, like only, in order to make people feel like the heavy act in their mind isn't heavy. Mm -hmm. It's not helping them. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I often joke, you know, um, Nike's just do it. Mm -hmm. What if it was do it? Yeah. Like how, how much more powerful is that phrase when you go, oh my gosh, um, when in doubt, do that thing. Yeah. And all of a sudden people start going, hey, I'm going to consider if I want to do this thing or not, which then leads into the second thing I bring up with enoughness. And that's um, recalibrating ourselves to hear our intuition. I define intuition as the voice that says, hey, do that. That sounds good. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. We all have that voice. And so many industries within, um, within our culture attempt to take the power of that voice away. Mm -hmm. So think about, um, you know, uh, think about clean your plate. Yeah. Think about, um, you know, when your mind says stop, just keep going. Mm -hmm. Or when your body wants to quit, just keep going. Yeah. And I'm like, Mind oh my gosh. Never matter. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, like I, I, uh, I, I 180, you know, degrees disagree with, with that mentality because if we don't listen to the well, um, calibrated machine that we are as, as a human being, and, and I'm not saying machine, like fuel the machine, but like, like there's elements to how we are created that is pretty phenomenal. Um, and one of those things is this voice that brings all of that together. And that's that intuition. Mm -hmm. So, um, how wonderful when, um, the child, um, starts to become sensitive to what their voice is, is saying yeah. and how does the parent voice play into that? Well, if we go back to that, rather than being on the same level, if that parent exists one step below the child and the child goes, I know that my parent um, has experience and care and investment in me. Um, and uh, 
I am making a decision and all of a sudden um, that decision leads me to a place I don't want to be. I fall down, I scrape my knee, I uh, stay up too late, I, I, I eat, the, eat the thing that um, like I, I ate a big bowl of ice cream without taking my, my lactate. And all of a sudden, the nine-year-old's going, mom, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, like, we need to remember to take our lactate. It's like, yeah, you're right. And all of a sudden, the kid goes, oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, and it's not because the parent is, is mandating or creating pathways of shame and fear, but the parent is amplifying the voice of their child's intuition inviting them to stop minimizing their language and all of a sudden what happens the kid starts having experiences where they are slowing down a bit to with no prefrontal lobe development make some logical patient well-discerned decisions and if they're not they're still open enough to learn Mm -hmm. because shame also takes away our capacity to learn yeah yeah it makes me think just for sort of our our last question here, it makes me think about or wonder if there are certain individuals in our society that may be at higher risk for developing shame. And how does sort of the nutrition, food, fitness industry feed into that? By golly. And this is, this is where, um, this is where I my stomach turns, and I also um, see a lot of hope. So uh, in this research, uh, we asked a lot of questions and um, um, asked if people strongly or somewhat agreed with with these phrases. This phrase, uh, I think, says a lot. So we asked everybody, do you feel comfortable in your own skin? Do you agree with that or disagree with that? The, the community of people who most agreed with the phrase, I feel comfortable in my own skin, in my own skin are, um, were African-Americans. Where if you think, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of research that puts um, Black Americans on the top of a, on the top of a list. Mm-hmm. White Americans, Hispanics, lower than them. And if we look to this even more broken down um, between men and women, um, we can also guess who has, um, you know, lower um, positive perceptions about themselves, women do, than men. Yeah. Because because who do we, who, who does the industry, um, who does food and fitness um, attempt to sell their stuff to? Yeah. White, white women. Um, so uh, the fact that um, Black Americans feel the most comfortable in their own skin because we market the least to them, yeah. it says that systemically, the way that we sell the idea of fitness and food and wellness and health is grounded in shame. Is grounded in shame. Yeah. It's, <sighs> wow. it's horrible, but it's also pretty clear. If we make people feel not enough, they will invest in the things that we are selling to make them enough, to make them better. But in reality, people want to be well. People want to care about themselves. People want to live happy, healthy, whole lives. What if that's where we started? So to your point, um, all of this is, is more complex than, 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 than a simple quote or a simple idea or pathway. But if it's grounded within a relationship, where people see us seeing them and see the shame that they carry, not as them, but as something that they are carrying, then all of a sudden we can go, oh yeah, um, I can at the same time acknowledge the, the stuff that I carry and acknowledge that the person that I am is whole. Um, and that's what we want to nourish. Yeah, Nourish the person, not the shame. Mm, I love that. I love that. JC. Such a great conversation. Well, this is the best. I love having you on this show. Where can people reach out and connect with you? Yeah, so um, I I mean this when I say it. My my greatest uh, thing that I ever get in life is is social collateral. I love connecting with people. So um, you can go to jclippold.com. 
um, and see all the things that I'm up to. But also, speaking of social media, um, LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook, uh, please do not hesitate to, uh, to, to share a message, um, to ask a question. Um, because more and more, um, I find that there is a lot of magic and a lot of power and an opportunity for me to learn, um, from, from, from anyone and everyone. So please reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the Nourish Child. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.